everyone! Welcome to your first video on kinetics. So this is the first one of many in this wonderful kinetics series. Um, my name is Dr. Bieberdorf and I'm the one who gets to teach you about kinetics. Um, I have to give you a quick disclaimer. I actually did all my PhD work on kinetics and catalysis, so I apologize in advance if I get a little bit excited about this um, and start speaking a little quickly. So this is also a reminder uh, for those of you who are new to my teaching style, you can slow me down if you are not quite used to my rate of speech. Okay, so the very first episode we're going to go over in kinetics is on reaction rates. So this is episode 10, reaction rates. But before I define what reaction rates are and go into them a little bit, um, a little bit deeper, I guess, what I want to do first is differentiate between thermodynamics and kinetics. So by now, I'm hoping that you all feel pretty comfortable with what thermodynamics is and how we apply it in our everyday lives. But just in case, like, let's just make sure we're all on the same page here. So by definition, thermodynamics can tell us if a reaction is energetically favorable, meaning it's spontaneous, but it cannot tell us how fast or slow that reaction will actually occur. So thermodynamics is the energy component. Will the reaction happen? Is it feasible? Can it happen alone in isolation? So if you have a skier at the top of a mountain or a hill or whatever, the thermodynamics perspective would be, it, can the skier fall down the hill? Can they go from the top of the hill down to the bottom of the hill? Yes, that can definitely happen on its own in isolation. That is a spontaneous process. Now the kinetics perspective is the rate component, the time component. How quickly can that skier go from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill? Well, if we're in Michigan, where all of our mountains are actually hills, we know that process is going to take us 30 seconds, maybe a minute. But if you go to real mountains, like in Colorado or whatnot, to go from the top of the hill to the bottom is going to take you two minutes. 10 minutes, maybe longer if you go to an amazing mountain, okay? So thermodynamics, will the skier go down the hill? That's energy, kinetics, how quickly, okay, how fast. So like I said, kinetics is all about how fast chemical reactions occur. For the first time in general chemistry one and two, we're finally talking about time, seconds, minutes, hours. We finally get to quantify the time component. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways. You can do it macroscopically or microscopically. So macro is what I had to do in lab for years and years and years in Welch, in UT, like constantly measuring kinetics from a macro perspective. So what I did is I would measure the rates of change. So you do that by measuring the rates of reactions, okay? You can do it by using a stopwatch and actually measuring out when you say you add A to B and then you can monitor how long it takes you to form C. That's the macroscopic perspective. In lab, you're measuring it in real time. We can do it with our human eyes. And the microscopic perspective is what's happening on the molecular level. How is reactant A reacting with B to form C? So from our perspective now, since we're expert chemists, that means we're thinking about how these molecules actually collide with each other. Are they hitting each other head on, tail on? Is it fast? Is it slow? Are they always interacting? How many collisions are actually occurring? So when we were thinking about thermal versus kinetics, it's how likely something is going to occur versus how fast. Now here within kinetics, we're talking about the macroscopic perspective, which is the in lab component, and then the microscopic perspective, which is inside that beaker. What are the molecules doing from a collision perspective? So let's look at a quick example here. So here I've got chloromethane, so CH3Cl, and what I'm going to do is react it with my hydride ion, my hydroxide ion, excuse me. You see, you all know that because you're acid base experts now. So I'm going to react the two together to get methanol and my chloride ion. So what I've shown here is a graph that has our reactant and product concentrations changing with time. So they're color coded, so we can see our blue one starts at the top, it's our reactant, and it's going to go all the way down in a beautiful, nice curve. Then for our methanol, since our product, it's going to start down here at zero, zero, right down here, okay, and then it's going to slowly increase and go all the way up over time. So the first question I'm going to pose to you is how would you determine the rate of the reaction from this graph? So take 10 seconds, think about it. Okay, pretend you're actually in class here. So I'm gonna pose this question to you. How would you determine the rate of the reaction from this graph? Think. Okay, hopefully you came up with an answer. And what you're going to do is figure out the slope, right? Rise over run, your math teacher's been teaching you this forever. And so we have to look at our Y component, divide it by our X component. So Y is concentration and your X is time. So your rate is going to be equal to your change in your concentration of something. So let's just pick reactant, that's fine. 
your change in your concentration of your reactant, and then you're going to divide that by your change in time. So now I'm going to use the little triangles, okay? But there's one piece that's missing here, and if we were in class, I would ask you, what did I do incorrectly? And so then hopefully you would all scream back at me and say, you made it positive. Because what we can see here is that our reactant is sitting right here. We have a high concentration as reactant, but as our reaction progresses, which we quantify by time, we can see that our concentration of reactant is getting lower and lower and lower. So for our rate, it's going to be the negative change in our concentration divided by a negative change in time. But we can do the same thing for our products, okay? So now we're looking at our products over time or as our reaction progresses, we see that we're forming more and more of our product. So now we would say rate is going to be equal to the positive version of the change of our concentration of our products divided by the change in our concentration of our time. Okay, so change in concentration of product divided by change in time. We can see that our product is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we can see that our reactant concentration is getting lower and lower. The one thing I wanna point out though, is that they are both equal to the same word rate, which means both of these species are gonna have the exact same rate. Okay, you're gonna gain your product in the same rate that you're gonna lose your reactant. This makes sense. You need one of A to form C type of thing. All right, so now next question. Okay, same graph, same example, I haven't changed anything. New question, where is the reaction rate the fastest? Take 10 seconds, think to yourself, come up with an answer, go. Seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, so where is the reaction rate the fastest? So hopefully you see that it's the spot where you have the steepest amount in your slope. So it's gonna be right here. When is it fastest, where is it fastest? at time equal to zero. Okay, we can see right here and right here that we have an extremely steep slope. Okay, for our reactant side, it's going, it's negative, and we're quickly losing our reactants. For our products, it's positive, and we're quickly forming products, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, so when we're looking for where our reaction rate is the fastest, it's right at the very beginning. But the question is, why? Why is that? We're gonna come to that in a little bit later, so keep that in the back of your mind. Why is that? So, three different definitions here when we talk about our rates or our reaction rates. We can have an initial rate, we can have an instantaneous rate, or we can have an average rate. So when we have an initial rate, that's what we just looked at, that's where our reaction is going to be our fastest. So initial rate is right here. We can call this point A if we want to. You don't have to, okay? That's gonna be your initial rate. That's gonna be at time T is equal to zero. Now your instantaneous rate, your instantaneous rate is going to be at one point. Your instantaneous rate is at one point. So I'm gonna go over here where time is equal to 20, go all the way up, I'm gonna point, pick this point and be point B, okay? And then you have your average rate. Your average rate is actually over a range. So we'll call that C, this is B and this is C, over a specific range. So I'm just gonna kinda make something up. We're gonna go from here to here. We wanna figure out what our range is, what our rate is over this range. And so that is called your average rate. So initial rate, that's where you're fastest, that's at point A, where your T is equal to zero. B is instantaneous rate, that is one point rise over run, that's a simple math, uh, math problem <laughs> from a math class. And then your C is going to be your average rate, so it's over a specific range. So to give you some numbers for this, if I calculated my initial rate at point A, that would be 0 0.003, and that's gonna be molar per hour, okay? At our initial rate, we've got 0 0.003. Now at our instantaneous rate, what we have is this one point at point B. I actually already calculated this out for at T equals zero, and our rate there is 0 0.0005 molar per hour. So we see it's significantly slower than what we saw for point A, which is our initial rate, as expected. We already know it's fastest. We don't know why yet, but we do know it's fastest. And then for your average rate over this range, you get a, something around 0 0.0008 molar per hour. Okay, so what we can see is as we move across our graph from left to right, um, which I probably just did backwards for the way our video is, um, but as you go from left to right, what you're gonna see is your reaction progresses, your time increases, and your rate is going to decrease. But why is that? We're still trying to figure that out. 
All right, so um, our reaction, a rate of a reaction is how quickly the reactants are being used up, that makes sense, or how quickly the products are being formed. So we have the exact same rate. This is the same rate. This is going to be equal to, so if I said this is the number 12, okay, your rate of 12 is going to be equal to how quickly we lose, how quickly we lose our reactants. And then it's going to be how quickly we can gain products. All of this stuff can be measured in lab. This is macroscopic. This is what I did. I had to sleep in Welch in my boss's office underneath his desk. Not really, but I stored my sleeping bag underneath his desk. I would sleep in his office and I would measure my sample over and over and over again. And I would try to figure out how quickly we would lose our reactants or on other reactions, I would measure how quickly I was gaining my products. So you can pick one or the other. Doesn't really matter because the rate in theory is going to be the exact same. But we're chemists and we're brilliant chemists. And so instead of looking at the macroscopic perspective, we actually want to know what's going on in the microscopic level. So what we do there is we actually try to investigate the concentration and compare that to the reaction rate. So again, same reaction here. I haven't changed anything. But this time for this reaction to occur, what I want to do is assume that there must be a collision between the methyl chloride molecule and a hydroxide ion. Okay, you've got to assume that. That makes sense. We've got one reactant here, one reactant here. So in order for our reaction to occur, there has to be a collision between these two. No problem, okay? Now, moving down here, what we see is there's four different images from four different solutions here of this reaction. So our blue one is going to be our methyl chloride, and our pink one is going to be our hydroxide ion. So I'm going to go through here and label each of these as A, B, C, and D. <coughs> Excuse me. So A, B, C, and D. So we've got four different solutions here and four different snapshots. The first thing I see as an expert in kinetics is that my ratios are all off. They're very different, and so that's going to give me different reaction rates. So in my A sample, I see I have two pink spheres for every two purple spheres. So we're going to have a one-to-one -one ratio of methyl chloride to hydroxide ions. In my snapshot for solution B, instead I see that I have one two of my methyl chlorides, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six of my hydroxide ions. So that gives me a one to three ratio. Then in my next one, I see that that's inverted. So I have a three to one ratio. And then in my very last one, I see that I have the exact same ratio again. It's a one to one, but the concentration is significantly larger than that of A. So what I want to point out is that A and B have the exact same concentration of our methyl chloride. They each have two of our, our two molecules of our methyl chloride mm, molecules. We'll call it particles. That's fine. And then I also want to point out that A and C have the exact same concentration of our hydroxide ion. So there's some similarities here, even though they look like completely different spheres. So what we're going to do now is go through several different questions. And I'm going to actually ask you to stop, pause your video, think about this, pretend like you were in class, pretend there's a reef question happening right now. And so I'm going to ask you to pause your video, and then we're going to come back together and figure out what the answers are for these questions. So here's your first one. If the rate of reaction depends on a collision occurring between our methyl chloride and our hydroxide ion, which solution would have the highest reaction rate? Okay, take a second, think it through, pause your video, and we'll come back together. Which solution would have the highest reaction rate? So hopefully you did what I said and you paused the video and came up with an answer. And if you did, hopefully you answered D because D is the correct answer. So if we're looking for the highest reaction rate, what that really means is we're looking for our solution with the highest concentrations, highest concentrations, which really means from a microscopic level that we're looking for a solution with the highest number of particles, the highest number of species, the highest molarity, highest concentrations. But from a micro, a micro perspective, what we're really talking about is this is going to be the solution that has the most, I would ask for you if you're in class to yell it out and you would all scream collisions. 
Hopefully, maybe not. If you're watching this video, I'm probably not, but that's okay. Um, so we're looking for our species that's going to have the highest concentrations, meaning the most particles, meaning they're going to have the most collisions. If you want something to be fast, you want to give it a lot of material. Give it the highest probability of those molecules actually slamming into each other, allowing for A plus B to react to give us C. All right, next question here. Oh, and my computer's frozen. No, it's not. Okay, good. All right, next question. So. How much faster would the reaction rate be in solution B compared to solution A? Stop the video, do your best, come up with an answer. How much faster would the reaction rate be in solution B compared to solution A? So if you took a second and thought about this, hopefully you came up with the answer C. So we are going to see that solution B is three times faster than solution A. Why is that? Because we see that we have three times larger concentration of our hydroxide ion. Three times more particles, it's going to be three times faster. Okay, try another question here. How much faster would the reaction rate be in solution D compared to solution A? Stop the video, try it. How much faster would the reaction rate be in solution D compared to solution A? So like I said, hopefully you've been stopping this video, actually doing these questions yourself, and the correct answer is E, nine times faster. So hopefully what you came up with is the fact that in D, you're going to see that the concentration of your hydroxide ion and, and the concentration of your methyl chloride, CH3Cl, are going to be each three times faster. So three times three gives us an overall factor of nine. So D would be nine times faster than A. So if you're in a rush and you want your reaction to happen quickly, you're gonna increase your number of particles you have in solution, higher the concentration, the higher or the more number of collisions, and that's going to give you a faster reaction rate. So next time in episode 11, you are going to see that we're going to actually write some rate laws. Yay, the fun part. Um, so this is going to actually show us how the reaction rate depends on the concentration of the reactants. We showed you some examples. Now we're going to show you how to write the actual equations. Um, if we know the rate law for a reaction and the concentrations of the reactants, we can calculate the rate of the reaction. So check it out next time.